We're going for it. Good evening. This is restart number two, or this is restart number one, but I goofed up and forgot to turn my microphone on. It's something I would, it, would, it sounds like me. Anyway, God bless you. I'm Pastor Lenny. We're here tonight to talk about the love of God. Huh. <laughs> so grab your Bibles. We're going to study for a while from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I was praying this morning and studying some, and I became aware of the fact, I was reminded, tomorrow is the National Day of Prayer. That's where uh, Christians are invited, and all people of all faiths are invited to pray for the nation. And a, lot of, a lot of things certainly need our attention in prayer. I happen to be one who believes that God will hear and answer prayer, so I pray strong prayers that I believe He can bring to pass. And I want you to do the same. But in this spiritual warfare aspect of things, when uh, Christians go to prayer, sometimes we pray prayers of worship against the enemies of our God and what He intends to do and His purposes in our land. And sometimes we pray prayers of thanksgiving and praise for what He's already doing or what He has done. And so I, as I was uh, reminded of popular songs concerning America, uh, the, the song God Bless America came up in my mind, and so I pulled up a little history about it, and I was amazed to read this little testimony. Of course, this was written by Irving Berlin. He lived from 1888 to 1989, so that was a good, long, blessed life, wasn't it? But listen to the story about God Bless America. You know, God Bless America, land that I love. It was the most famous one-verse song that's ever been written. That's what I'm told. Of course, as far as humans' recording ability goes. But this little story behind God Bless America, this, this, is, this simple one-verse song became an overnight hit and a hopeful song as war threatened. It's not a patriotic song, composer Irving Berlin said in a 1940 interview, but an expression of gratitude for what this country has done for its citizens, of what home really means. Today, many Americans consider God Bless America an unofficial national anthem of the United States. Now, let me read a little bit about Irving Berlin's, Irving Berlin's life. And then I'm going to contrast this song to another song before I get you into 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So you just hold the mark there because we're going to get in some Bible verses in a minute. The life of Irving Berlin is a uniquely American success story. He was born Israel Berlin in the Jewish village of Tyumen in a harsh region of Russia known as Siberia. When he was about five, an anti-Jewish mob destroyed his family's home, and the Baileens set out for America. They settled on New York's Lower East Side. Irving Berlin's father died when he was eight, and Izzy went to work selling newspapers to help support his family. As a young teen, he began singing in saloons, and at some point taught himself piano. He began copying the musical styles of the day and developed an incredible instinct for creating popular tunes that people loved to sing. A printing error on a published piece of sheet music left him with the name Irving Berlin, and that was the name he carried as he wrote song after song. In 1911, he wrote his first huge dance hit, Alexander's Ragtime Band. That was a great song. Excuse me. <clears throat> after that, the Berlin's career took off. After that, Berlin's career took off like a rocket. Excuse me. Got a cough. Oh, into the wild blue yonder. Help me, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Anyway, it's list several of Irving's songs. 
that were popular. Flipped myself off trying to save you from having to listen to me cough or sneeze. He wrote, White Christmas, Blue Skies Always, There's No Business Like Show Business, Heat Wave, I've Got My Love to Keep Me Warm, and God Bless America. Wow, now those are some hit songs. When describing his goal as a songwriter, Berlin said, my ambition is to reach the heart of the average American. That vast intermediate crew, which is the real soul of the country, my public, is the real people. That's what Irving wrote about his songwriting desire. So he had a desire to write songs to everybody in America that had experienced some sort or some sort of blessing from being in this country. Kate Smith, one of the great singers of her day, had asked for a number, for a new number for her radio show. The year was 1938, and she was looking for something fresh to mark the 20th anniversary of the end of the Great War, what would later be called World War I. Irving Berlin had composer's block. Berlin felt the urgency to deliver. He, recently, he had recently returned from Europe where catastrophe was brewing. Nazi Germany, Germany, led by Adolf Hitler, was growing more powerful and aggressive and seemed to be preparing for war. But Berlin wasn't focused on writing a Get America Ready for War song. He wanted to create something to celebrate America as a special place to live. Then he remembered a song he had drafted years earlier. He pulled out an old trunk and dusted off the 20-year-old manuscript. And then there's a picture of it here on this little bio. Reviving and revising a forgotten song. In 1918, Sergeant Irving Berlin was stationed at Camp Upton in Yaphank on Long Island, New York. Berlin was already a successful songwriter, now a draftee and his commanding officer enlisted him to write a musical review to help raise money for a new building. The, the result was Yip Yap Yap Hank, and a light-hearted musical review about army life featuring music skits and military drills. The show produced one of the hits of World War I, Oh, How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning, a comic song about a soldier's reluctance to answer reveille the army's early AM alarm clock played on a bugle. Berlin had written another song for the review, but had cut it from the show. He thought the lyrics were too sappy, so God Bless America waited in that trunk for two decades. Then Kate Smith came calling. Now Berlin looked over his earlier work and rapidly began re rewriting and revising. He had less than two weeks to get it ready for her performance. Here is how the 1918 version had read. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her to the right with the light from above. Make her a victorious on land. Make her victorious on land and foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. Berlin knew he had to change the line to the right with the light from above. The right in politics had come to mean conservative political groups. <laughs> he wanted a song that brought Americans together, not set Americans apart. And he changed Make Her Victorious, since it suggested military conquest, rather than the peace song he was shooting for. The result was the song most American school kids have learned by heart ever since. It goes like this. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies, to the ocean white with foam, God bless America, my home sweet home. So that's the version that became so popular. Smith sang the song, this is Kate Smith, the song as uh, the show closer on her live national broadcast that night. Berlin's phone immediately began ringing off the hook. Everyone wanted to know where they could get the music. 
After that, Smith almost always included the song in her weekly show, and it became her trademark during a career that spanned five decades. She also added a short poem prelude that Berlin had written. While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to the land that's free. Let's all be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in solemn prayer. Now, every week she's closing with that little poem, which shows you the heart of Irving Berlin concerning America, which is what I want you to see. Storm clouds were indeed gathering over Europe. Less than a year after the debut of God Bless America, Germany's war machine rolled into Poland, igniting, the world, war, igniting world War II in Europe. The Japanese had already invaded China two years earlier, beginning the war in Asia. The United States would not officially join the war until the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. But as God Bless America grew in popularity, most Americans already feared that it was just a matter of time before the U.S. would be called to fight. During World War II, Berlin toured with his show, This is the Army to Raise Money for the U.S. War F Effort. God Bless America was one of the featured songs. The God Bless America Foundation, when it came to God Bless America, Irving Berlin and Kate Smith, put their money where their mouths were. They donated all the royalties from the hit song to the boy and Girl Scouts of America through God Bless America Foundation. That arrangement is still in effect today. Other wartime songs would remind Americans what were they, they were fighting against. Berlin's God Bless America reminded them of what they were fighting for. Amen. Now, I have another song review right as soon as I bring your attention to this, these verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, uh, this, this scripture reads, For Christ's love compels us, as the Apostle Paul is sharing with the church at Corinth. He's sharing his heart like Irving Berlin shared his heart concerning America when he, when he was uh, writing this little song, what was in his heart. Him being an immigrant from another nation, coming to this country and settling in, and receiving the benefits of God's blessing while in this nation. And Paul is explaining to the people of his day, the church of his day, why he's compelled to keep on preaching the gospel. And so he, his motivation, Paul is going to explain to us, my motivation for, for preaching the gospel is because I understand by the Holy Spirit interpreting the words of Jesus, the scriptures for me, uh, and having uh, seen the work of Jesus firsthand, that all men, if we were to kind of relate between America and, and the Christian believer, all men are born dead in their trespasses and sins. That was the thing that compelled uh, the Apostle Paul to preach because he knew as, and he had heard and it had been revealed to him that all men that are born in the flesh are born dead in their trespasses and sins. It's, it was a spiritual law. And he was committed to sharing the truth about what can happen to a man a woman, a boy, or a girl, if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, that he will save them out of their deadness, spiritually speaking. And uh, as Paul had learned to live in that revelation, he was moved by the love of God to keep sharing so that maybe someone, even though he was persecuted and people were hollering at him from all sides and... and uh, at times he wasn't very well liked in certain communities. Someone might hear that they need to be saved and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, I'm going to switch over to my King James. 
And uh, in this particular case, some of these words are a little King Jamesy, but I'll try to, you know, elaborate on them a bit. A bit. For the love of Christ constraineth us. That's what the King James reads. In the in this probably NIV it says compels. But the word constraineth was a word that means compels. Either in in the way I had it explained to me from original an original language teacher was. This word constrained means that you would, either, you would be pushed forward in your conviction while held back by the same conviction. You'd be pushed forward in the love of Christ while held back yes. from obeying the flesh. So it's kind of a two, two-way street. So Paul says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. Now see, with that little precursor to that, that verse right there, you, it's just like it just sinks in deep. All are born in the flesh. They're born dead in trespasses and sin. That's what compelled Paul to undergo the hardships that he underwent so that people might hear the gospel and be saved. Now, let me read a couple more verses because this gets real preachy if I don't. Verse 15 then goes on to say, and, the, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Verse 16, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. And then the famous verse 17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Because the love of God compelled Paul, constrained Paul, uh, to tell you that if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior and ask him to forgive your, you of your sins, then you're still lost and dead in your trespasses and sins, which separates you from the love of God, from his ability or his desire. Not You can't get in between God's ability, but his desire to love you and his willingness to do that, apart from you coming into faith, he set the standard and you have no, you have no say in it. You can choose. You're, there's a lot of good people who choose not to believe in Christ. Don't get me wrong, this nation is full of people of all different faiths. Not all of them are wicked and ugly and demon-possessed. There's a lot of good people who don't believe in Christ, but I'm here to tell you the love of God constrains me too, and just like it did to some degree, at least in me, it's working that I might tell you, you can be the finest person on the planet with a good moral core, with a good savings plan, with a good job, with a reputable name in the community, but if you don't have Christ, you were born dead in the law of sin and death, and Christ needs you to know that you could live Amen. for eternity with him in the presence of God and don't pass up the opportunity because today is the day of your salvation. Yes. Now, <clears throat> tomorrow is a national day of prayer. In America. And that's what I'm primarily praying for and encouraging saints to get on board and go to the place in your city where, de where prayer is going to be offered. In our city, sometimes it's at the flagpole at City Hall. But even if you don't go anywhere but your own front room, you can take the moment at the lunch hour and pray. Could you not pray with me one hour, the Lord says? And pray for America, that America might truly be saved. And if you haven't been saved, you can bless America by giving your heart to Jesus. Now, there's a blessing of God that comes to people of faith in Christ. It's not that God doesn't desire to bless all people. 
but not all people accept him. I think I got a cough again. <laughs> but what I want you to listen to now for the next few minutes, I got a few minutes of preaching to do yet. I want to read to you a contrasting song. And I, I think all of this is relative. You got another famous songwriter. Uh, that has written a song that takes a little different approach. Now this songwriter, you'll rec you may or may not recognize his name, but you'll recognize his song. But his, his name was Woody Guthrie. Uh -huh. And Woody wrote a song, This Land is Your Land. Now, it was a contrast to Irving's song, God Bless America, Land That I Love. And what Woody was trying to tell the people was, I've been down the roads of America. I've been, on the, been traveling across America on uh, you know, trains, on foot, on horseback, on wagons, and I've seen the American people, and the American people aren't feeling so blessed these days. They're, they're in a great, great need. Most of them have these horrible things happening in their life. <coughs> and he was saying, for me to sing God bless America, in a, in a sense, I didn't know what his life was like when he, when he moved off the planet, but during the time of the writing of this song, he was not giving, not willing to give God any glory for blessing America at all. In fact, he was saying the opposite, that whatever you have, whatever you're enjoying or not enjoying is a product of what you're doing. This land is your land, not God's land. That's what he was saying. Now, I'm, I'm going to read this review on this song, and it's not my words. It's the documentary written around this song. But I'm wanting you to, to hear me out here tonight. There are many, many good people, wonderful people, nice people, honorable people in our land that take that view, that this land is, is only what it is because we made it this way. God had nothing to do with it. I happen to disagree with that worldview. I believe that those who have entered into a faith relationship with God through Jesus Christ have his blessing upon their life. And even though they will experience hardship, they'll go through times of struggle, they'll go to, through times of trouble, they will wonder sometimes why they're even doing what they're doing and believe in God while they're doing it. On the, at the other end, they'll come out blessed. You will see God's glory rest upon those who have faith in the Father through Jesus Christ. Now, Irving Berlin lived a long life with blessing. He accredited it because he had faith in the God that he couldn't see. He accredited the fact that he lived in America was an act of his God. Woody, on the other hand, said, I don't see God in any of this. I see humans suffering. I see humans struggling. I see humans hurting. And those of you who say you're blessed are not overlooking them. You're overlooking their need wherein you have a picture of those who live in their humanness on the side of the suffering and the shame and there's never enough and things are always going against them. Those who live there, and there are many, and 
they would sometimes speak back into the believing side, the Christian side, and say, well, you're not really seeing the reality that's going on behind the scenes of your wild professions and confessions of faith. But I'm here to say, don't be fooled. The believer has a blessing of God. And our faith is toward God because we've learned to love the Father with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. And he treats us as a father. And those who are outside the family of faith are fatherless. Well, actually, Jesus said, you're of your fa- if you are a viper and wicked and evil, you're of your father, the devil, which everyone born in the, under the law of sin and death had a, the nature of the enemy and the, the nature of the flesh, the world, and the devil, nature of destruction, hopelessness, and despair. But a born-again believer has uh, the, this hope that we place in God Almighty. Our minds are anchored in the hope of the resurrection. And we know we have life beyond this life. And we live with an expectancy of seeing Jesus when we die or when he comes again. And that just keeps us and compels us to keep on going and sharing and telling you that if, if you've never accepted Christ, then you're still in your you're still dead in your trespasses and sins, and we would hope that you would reconsider your decision and face it. Ask God to forgive you. And accept His Son Jesus as a sacrifice for your sin. You don't have to understand it with your head. You know it in your heart. You know I'm telling you the truth because God doesn't lie and receive His Son Jesus Christ today. So continuing on with my little, this land is your land. Here's a little piece on that song. Let's see if I can find a place to start. Folk singer Woody Guthrie celebrates America's bounty and protests that not all Americans were getting their fair share. Now, I've heard this. Well, that's not fair, Brother Lenny, for the Christians to get all the blessing. We ought to have some, some law that gives everyone common access to all the common goods all over the world. What does that sound, sound like? Sounds like what the things are heating up about right now. The the war of the kings. Uh, that's the time. This is the time when the the kings are preparing for war. They're uh, rattling their swords. They're blowing their horns. They're uh, declaring their declarations yes, sir. because they want Americans and the rest of the free world to share their part with them without ever having given thought to the fact that God has blessed those nations whose God is the Lord. And it's a time when revival is erupting in our land and around the world where God is trying to awake you sleepers to the fact that the blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow. And if someone's not getting their fair share, then those who say, Pastor Lenny, you're rubbing the cat the wrong way. I stand with Pastor John Osteen. Let the cat turn around. You need to turn your life around. He's talking about this land is your land. Uh, I guess I, uh, I I have to click on the article before I can read it. <laughs> My computer skills are increasing daily. <laughs> this land is your land, the story behind the song. Today, this classic folk song is usually sung as a popular pro-American anthem by Americans of every background. 
but it was written to have a radical edge that hollered for the country to make its bounty available to rich and poor alike. Folk singer Woody Guthrie was sick of that song, that, the one about, uh, that uh, Irving Berlin wrote, God Bless America. The year was 1939, and everywhere he wondered, God Bless America was playing on the radio. It was driving Guthrie nutty. Guthrie felt that Irving Berlin's song was too sappy, too blindly patriotic, and too cut off from the hard-knock life many Americans were facing as the Great Depression dragged into its tenth year. Guthrie knew firsthand how tough life could be for poor folks. Since his teens, he had hopped trains and hitchhiked back and forth across, across the country. He shared the road with former farmers, laid off factory workers and migrants chasing hopes of work. Along the way, he chronicled their adventures, dreams, and sorrows in song. In February 1940, Guthrie decided to fight music with music. In reaction to God Bless America, he worked up a simple song that tried to capture his love of the American landscape, at the same time, he wanted to point out that a lot of Americans weren't feeling blessed at all. This is the story behind This Land is Your Land. And then it goes on to give you the ver verses in this article of This Land is Your Land. This land is my land from California to the New York Island. From the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. As I was walking that ribbon of highway, I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw, my, I saw below me that golden valley. This land was made for you and me. And, and you can look up the song on, on your uh, internet uh, um, device if you want to. But for the sake of time, I want to read on. Wood, uh, Woodrow Gu uh, Wilson Guthrie was born in the small town of Okama, Oklahoma on July 14, 1912 named for the soon-to-be-elected Democratic candidate for president, Guthrie remembered an early boyhood full of music, singing, and plenty of pocket money. His dad was a successful real estate wheeler dealer. The Guthries were the first people in town to own a car. Tragedy and trouble began to mount after 1919. Guthrie's sister died in a fire, and his dad's business collapsed. His mom had a nervous breakdown, and he was committed to the state mental hospital. He and his brother were left, be left to fend for themselves. The teenager began to travel the country, strumming his guitar and singing for coins. As he wandered, he became increasingly critical of the injustice he associated with American capitalism. He was drawn toward the plight of American workers and embraced socialist beliefs. During World War II, though, he served in the Merchant Marine and U.S. Army. He entertained sailors and troops with songs blasting fa fascism, the brutal nationalistic system of government operated by Germany's Adolf Hitler and Italy's Benito Mussolini. Guthrie viewed folk music as a potent means of protest about his writing and singing he said I'm out to sing songs that will prove to you that this is your world and that if it, that if it has hit you pretty hard and knocked you for a dozen loops no matter what color what size you are how you are built I am out to sing the songs that make you take pride in yourself and in your work and the songs that I sing are made up, for the most part, by all sorts of folks just about like you. Guthrie died of Huntington's disease in 1967, but not before inspiring a new generation of singer-songwriters, including Ramblin' Jack Elliott, Bob Dylan, and Bruce Springsteen. So I thought that was an amazing contrast between two different people's lives. One was blessed, and one experienced severe curse. And I'm 
thinking it's because of the place of honor that the two stood. One was in a place of honor uh, and trusting God for the outcome in their life. The other one was trusting their own goodness and their own abilities, whether or not Guthrie thought they were God-given or not, he didn't say. Usually if a man has faith, he'll say, I have these gifts, I have these talents, I have these abilities because God put them within me to make my own way in this that he's given me as my inheritance as I'm granted permission to cooperate or co-work with God in his domain. Now, tomorrow, as we're praying for our country, we still have this same battle going on between the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I would that God would move upon America and lift people out of the poverty of sin, the hurt and the woundedness of damaged souls and emotions caused by a wicked and evil enemy on the death side of the life cycle, living under the law of sin and death. For God to do that, he would want you to be saved. He would want you to acknowledge him as your father and thank him for sending his son Jesus Christ to die for your sins and my sins. For if one died for all, then all were dead. And our obligation as Christians to our Father is to save people, whether you're on the, the poverty side of life or the hardship side of life or in moments in your life where nothing seems to be going right, Jesus is still the answer. The Father God has the answer, and you, you and I, we can approach him through faith in his Son and be saved. And even though you, you'll live out your life in whatever status the Lord has granted you to live out, you may never be the first person in town to own an automobile. You may not ever be a wheeler dealer, real estate ty tycoon. But you could very well be the individual who gave your heart to Jesus Christ began to embrace God the Father and love him with all your heart, soul, and mind so that your life was transformed. And at the end of your day, you could say, I've, I've had a blessed life. God gave me great grace and great mercy that I might fulfill his will and his purpose by coming to Christ, making him known throughout my life as the God and the Savior of my soul. I love him so. So that's what I came to tell you tonight. Pray for America tomorrow. As things are heating up with these various threats of war that are on the horizon, don't live in fear but live in faith that God could resolve this thing until the time of the earth is done. He step in and intervene for us. I'm believing he will. Our national leaders would have wisdom. If they're not going to yield to God's wisdom, then God would do something to um, uh, intervene on our behalf. And, uh, you know, move things out of the way so he can move things in to position con that, that are willing to faithfully commit and, and submit to God Almighty. In the meantime, trust God. Trust him at his promises. The promises of God, the scripture said, are yes and amen, but they're only yes and amen to the believer. I looked up a verse, I think it's in John, last half, yeah, it's the last half, uh, chapter of John. I'll close with this. Let me turn over there. I've got a few minutes left in this preaching session. Let me see if I'm right. Now, it must, hang on. I'll find it because I'm a smart Bible searcher. Amen. Amen. 
There's a song written about it. That's the reason it came to my mind. But it's where it might be the, the last part of Luke, where Jesus came after his resurrection. He spoke to his disciples. And he said, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And these signs will follow them that believe. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll uh, do all sorts of wonderful miracles and signs and wonders will follow those who have believed. There, it's in Mark, the last chapter of Mark. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> I'll go over there and read it exactly as it is because I kind of lamely quoted it. I got tickled at it. One of my friend's grandsons said, last Sunday night, Pastor Lenny didn't preach from the Bible. That was the Sunday I was exhorting on the ministry of helps. And I told Grandma, I said, you tell him he was good. I, he's reminded Mark me 16. to stay in that word. Mark 16, not 19. Mark 16? Yeah. Okay. Well, gosh, you're right. Cause I'm, I'm sitting right there. Anyway, this grandson was reminding Pastor Lenny to stay with the Bible. <laughs> I was like, well, that's pretty good, Grandma. You're teaching that boy to be observant. But I took a night off from preach teaching to exhorting uh, Christians to do what they've already been taught to do. That's what was my emphasis on the last Sunday night that I preached. Anyway, here in uh, Mark 16, verse 15, Jesus is going to speak to these disciples after he appeared to them. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that is believed, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, you can use other translations to interpret those various acts of faith that people were doing. We don't go around handling snakes around here, but if we happen to run onto one, we're going to shake it off in the fire, just like John did. And then, verse 19 is what I wanted to spend the night, a, a little bit of emphasis while we close the night. So then after that, the Lord had spoken unto them. He was received unto heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And then verse 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, amen. Now, I want, I, what, what, what I was thinking when I was remembering this verse this morning in my studies was, here I've contrasted these two songs, one from a, an apparent man who had faith in God and one who had faith in man, even though he considered himself to be blessed and was, I'm obviously a good man. But his emphasis Ms. Guthrie's emphasis was more on this land is your land. And our other author emphasis was more on thank God that you allowed me to live in this land. Right. Now, one man is saying on the negative side of this, you know, this comparison here, you're you're responsible. You go, whatever you have, you did it. Oh, I, I wish I could tell you a story. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging, you know, that you've accomplished something or your parents have accomplished something and you're proud of them and affirming them in positive ways. But to say that you did it on your own, and I've had, oh my goodness, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. Well, I've got all this because I, I did this. I have everything I have because I worked my rear end off, so to speak. You know, 
don't necessarily use that word, but <clears throat> it's by the sweat of my brow that I have accomplished these things. On the other hand, there's no less work and there's no less effort applied in the work of these other men and women's hands, but they're attributing the success to God because he's the one that gave them the life. He's the one that gave them the gifts of grace by which they performed their responsibilities and their duties. And uh, they accomplished these things because God positioned them and they weren't afraid to acknowledge that. It's still the battle in America today. Young people all the way through to the elderly. We need to realize that if we've accomplished anything in life, God is the one who permitted that to take place because of his love for us. And in the end, we inherit eternal life and get to live forever in the presence of God. So I'm exhorting you tonight, America, bless God. And sing God Bless America tomorrow as a cry, a fervent cry of appreciation, but also intercession. God Bless America again. As we come online with a people who believe you, who trust you, who do because you've empowered them to do. And when we walk into the moment of appreciating what we have, let gratitude return to America that goes to God. God bless America. Be sure and pray throughout the day tomorrow, off and on, take an hour at lunchtime, pray for America, and America shall be saved. I'm going to cut you loose for tonight. I love you. Jesus loves you. Take good counsel from this lesson tonight. Receive Christ as your Savior and tell someone about it. Search out a good God-fearing Bible-believing church and start growing in your faith. God loves you and we love you and Jesus is Lord. Good night now.